Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Go Behind the Scenes Application Reading. So today you'll get an inside look from QuestBridge staff on what they look for as they're reading applications, as well as other advice they have to offer. So to quickly introduce myself, my name is Marla Ross. I'm a program associate on the high school programs team here at QuestBridge, and I also happen to be a QuestBridge alum. So application reading is one of my favorite parts of my job since I get to be on the other side of the application process this time around and learn about the students applying. So I'll be moderating today's session and I'll be joined by three other QuestBridge staff members who will share their perspectives on application reading. So without further ado, I'll let the others joining us today introduce themselves too, starting with Vanessa. Hello everyone, it's so nice to be here and share our perspectives as it relates to reading. My name is Vanessa Chen. I am the director of the College Partnerships team here at QuestBridge, and I will be entering my eighth year of reading applications, which is nuts to think about that I have been with QuestBridge for so long, but I've really enjoyed reading applications. It's one of my favorite parts of my role, um, very similar to Marla, and I think it just always keeps us on our toes when we get to learn more about you all and um, all the great work that you, you do. So I will turn it over to Nayeli. Hi everyone, um, my name is Nayeli Lopez. I am the Senior Communications Associate with the Scholar Programs team here at QuestBridge. And I've had about three years experience um, with reading applications. And like the others have said, I'm, I really enjoy reading and being able to kind of see a little bit more about the students that we support um, since we work day to day on on programs that uh, they get to see, it's nice to actually read their stories. So very excited to join you all today. Hello, everybody. My name is Clay Kingsbury, and I'm a program associate on the College Partnerships team at QuestBridge. Like Marla, I also happen to be a QuestBridge alum, so I very much enjoy reading applications. It also is one of the favorite components of my job. Um, this will be my second year reading applications, and I'm really excited to share um, my insights with all of you today. Great. Thank you all so much. So let's quickly go over the topics we'll be discussing today. First, we'll cover application reading itself, so essentially what our reading process is like and what we're looking for. Then we'll dive into a few different sections and components of the application, including the household section, the required recommendation, academic and activities sections, the writing section, and then we'll close out by having the panelists share a few final tips with you all based on their experience. All right, so let's start by touching on application reading itself. And to give you an idea of what applications looked like in the previous cycle, we received over 15,000 applications and selected 3,908 high school juniors as college prep scholars. So if you're wondering how we go about that selection process, that's what we're going to talk about right now. Starting with the holistic review process. So what does it mean to view an application holistically? I can take that one. So when we talk about holistic application review, and it may be a term that you hear a lot either from us or from admissions officers or other schools, um, it really does mean that we're looking at every component of your application, everything that you're filling out on the QuestBridge application from your personal background, your family and household information, your academics, your recommendations, all of those pieces, and we take all of them into consideration in our evaluation. So there isn't one section that is given more weight or looked at differently than any other section in the application, which is why as we go through this um, webinar today, you'll hear from us and probably hear us say a lot, you know, give us all of the context and information that you feel like would really help us get to know you because of our holistic review process, right? We want to get to know who you are as a person, all of the factors that have um, contributed to your achievements and your success and um, really get that full picture because we do look at everything and take all of that into account. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for taking that. So next we're going to move to the household section. And our first question is, how can students ensure that they are explaining their financial situation accurately and thoroughly? I can take that one. And I think echoing off of what Vanessa just said, 
something that is really important, especially for the family and household situation is context. Context is key. And one of the things that we love to see is when students are using the additional information sections, that can help us as readers to better understand your own personal financial circumstances and how your family is navigating that. And one of the things that you can use that section for is to be able to explain if there are any large changes in income or any irregular irregularities that year. And if you had to estimate any of the numbers in that section, you can use um, that additional information sections to talk about that there. And one of the examples of something that we see often is if there are high unreimbursed medical bills or anything like that, students, you can use that section to tell us why and to talk about how those bills are impacting your family. And that paints a better picture of what your financial circumstances are. So I think the advice that I can share is to really use those additional information sections because if we don't know something, we can't then make a determination off of it. I would just add to that um, to try to work on this section with your parents and guardians if possible, um, if you have that access to them, definitely use them as an uh, just to put more accuracy in what you're answering on those sections, um, especially because um, these some of the directions might be unclear to you so definitely read those directions clearly and if you have someone else with you who is familiar with the information that you're inputting it'll be very helpful. Um, you definitely want to read those directions carefully and be able to understand all the specific instructions. So definitely be sure that you're reading out every single instruction and then have someone to help you too when you're doing it. And adding to that, we do have a lot of resources available to you as an applicant. So when you go through the um, income and household sections, we have different resources such as the income and assets guide. And um, that is a great spot for you to better understand what some of the terms mean if you're ever struggling with something that we're asking you in the application and you're not quite sure what that refers to. It helps also to explain where you can find certain items if you're trying to look at your parents' tax returns, how you can look at certain lines and kind of bring that amount and that figure over to our application. Um, another thing that I would add is if you have contact with a non-custodial parent, it's going to be really important for us to get that full picture there as well and for you to provide as much context and information to the best of your ability on that non-custodial parent, um, that the income, assets, um, and the colleges will also require this in their application process. So it's going to be important that the information that you provide us will align with the information that you will later be reporting to the schools that we work with. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I think those are all really important points that you brought up and report important, not only tips, but reminders of things that you'll need to include. So for the next question, uh, what are some common mishaps in this section of the application that you see and how can students avoid them? One of the common mishaps that I've seen in this section is when students assume that we're going to understand something and honestly, we likely won't if you don't explain it. I think if you are not certain about something when you're filling out this section, please use those additional information sections as I was talking about earlier to explain it to us. Because if we're left with questions on your financial situation, we can't make an assessment without information present. So really try to fill out this section to the best of your ability and use those additional information sections to explain your circumstances. And then finally, please don't overuse I don't know or enter all zeros. You should really try your best to estimate using whatever information you have. And as I mentioned, if you are not sure of something or if you do have to use a zero or I don't know in some of the sections, use those additional information to explain what is going on with your family's financial circumstances. So that way we don't have to use our best judgment to try and guess what is going on there. Instead, we can use the information and able to make an accurate decision based on the information you're presenting to us. Really quick, I definitely that is true, but on the flip side of that, uh, just kind of on the technical side, if you do need to leave something empty, make sure that you do put a zero or something in the box there. Um, 
just because if there are any empty boxes, you might not be able to submit that section or you might get some errors. So really pay attention to those. And if you truly don't know um, the answer to some of those questions, you can input a zero, but please make sure you're explaining it in an additional information box that we mentioned before or something like that. But the boxes do need to be filled. Um, but like Clay said, don't overuse that, that zero in those cases. Thank you both. Those are really good points. And I know Clay and Nayeli, you just touched on this, uh, but I want to ask again, just to reiterate its importance, how important are the additional information sections uh, in this section of the application? So one of the things that we notice in our application evaluation process is a lot of the additional information sections tend to be underused by students. And we want you to view that as a place where, as Clay and Nayeli have mentioned already, and as we're going to continue to drive home during this conversation, is you know, provide us with as much context as you feel like is necessary to explain your situation. And don't be afraid to feel like you're over explaining something because it might seem straightforward and simple to you, whatever situation you're in, but conveying that and for us to see that in the application is kind of a different story. And we don't know who you are. The only place that we're getting really to know you is throughout the examples and the essays and all of that, which we'll get to um, that you're putting in your application, right? We don't have that opportunity to like meet you before you submit your application and get to know who you are. And um, that's why it's so critical for students to utilize this space, whether that's in the family or household situation um, or text boxes there with the additional information or other areas that we let you kind of give us more information about your situation, your application, anything like that will really help us better understand um, who you are and where you're coming from. And as you're doing that, make sure you're giving specific examples. So if you're explaining, as Clay mentioned earlier, um, medical bills, you know, to the best of your ability, give us those figures, those amounts, and be specific so that, again, we're not trying to fill in the gaps there and guess what you're trying to illustrate and convey to us as we are reviewing your application. Great, thank you so much for um, clarifying that and explaining a little bit more, Vanessa, on those sections. So next we're going to move to the recommendation section um, and just switch gears to talk about recommendations generally. Um, so what role do recommendations play in our review of the application? and how can recommendations add to an application? So the recommendations really give us a picture of a student's performance inside the classroom, um, as well as insight to who they are as a person, right? It's the only outside perspective in your application that we get on who you are. Um, other people can often talk about you in a different way or share qualities about you that maybe you don't even notice about yourself or that they can you know, kind of speak better to those aspects of who you are better than you can convey that through the short answers and the essay um, in the application. And so it really is a valuable perspective and um, we really enjoy learning more about you through another person's lens. And I also think recommendations can help to fill in the gaps that are in your application or about your story. Maybe there's information you weren't able to include earlier in your application or thought wasn't important to share that your recommender may touch on. So it is really important for us to have that outside perspective and to be able to gain that additional information. Recommendations also help to give us um, information about your high school context, where you're coming from, and what are the opportunities that students at your high school have. And especially in the past few years with the pandemic, we've really seen how recommenders can provide that additional context that can help us in our review process. So that is why recommendations are so important, because it provides that outside perspective and allows us to know the high school context that you're coming from. Yeah, that's, those are both really great points. Thank you for touching on that. Um, so the next question along the lines of recommendations um, is just how can students ensure that they're securing great recommendations? 
I can take that one. Um, so if you are asking your recommendation, your recommenders, make sure that you're telling them also about yourself and like what activities you're also involved in if they don't know that already. It's really helpful for them if you just give them context on who you are outside of the classroom if they're not aware of some of the activities that you're involved in. And also just tell them a little bit more about QuestBridge and what, you, what it is you're actually applying to. So they have that context and that knowledge when they're writing your recommendation and kind of have a better sense of who you are and what you want um, in this application. So they can really talk about that and bring up some points that we don't already know about them, about you actually. And then also give your recommenders some time, make sure that you're not asking them last minute or close to the deadline. Um, they are very busy and they probably have other recommendations that they are writing or you know, lots of other stuff that they have going on. So make sure that you give them time. Um, three to four weeks would be great. And also maybe some reminders um, if it's coming close to the deadline and they still hadn't submitted, um, that would be really helpful for them and just be nice about it, thank them. Um, the, this is something that they don't need to really be doing, but they want to, right? They wanna be helping you in this um, application for you. So make sure you're nice, you tell them about yourself, tell them about QuestBridge and give them time. Thank you, Nayeli. Those are great pieces of advice. I know it can be scary asking for recommendations. Um, so I hope that helps you feel prepared um, to ask someone and, and really thank them for their time as well. All right, so now let's switch gears and talk about the academic and activities section. So these are different sections. So we'll have a couple questions uh, pertaining to each. Um, but just to start off, what are the requirements for providing coursework information in the academic section? I can take that one. So I think one of the things that is definitely a requirement that we like to see in the academic section is a current high school transcript. We need the transcript and we also need you to enter in all three years worth of coursework. And please make sure to enter in current coursework as well. So those are the courses you're currently taking as those may not appear on your transcript. And we do accept unofficial transcripts. We do not require official transcripts. And either um, you can submit it or um, we also can accept it from your um, recommender as well, depending on the cycle. Thank you so much, Clay, for covering that. Um, so yes, coursework is very important. Um, your transcripts, including the most up-to-date information available. Um, but before we move on, what kind of information can students include in the academic additional information section? I think one thing that I would like to add as well is if there's a reason why you weren't able to take a certain class or your school isn't able to offer APs or you miss school because of an illness, you really can use this section of the academic um, section of the application to explain those circumstances and let us know why you weren't able to take that course or why you got a certain grade. And I think that can really help us when we're reviewing your academic performance to um, assess you accordingly. I would say something else you can mention on that additional information section would be some maybe online classes you're taking or classes that you're taking outside of your high school. Um, if you're doing, if you're involved in that, maybe at a junior college or an online course, something like that would definitely be helpful. Um, also, there's been lots of cases in the past where students maybe had to study uh, on their, for their AP test outside of their school. Maybe their school didn't offer that AP class, but they still wanted those, that to take that test. So they studied outside of it, that those kind of think, things would be really helpful to put in your additional information section. And the last point I'll add here is if there are areas in your kind of academic trajectory and high school coursework where you feel like your academic performance has been significantly impacted by something, that would be a great spot in the additional information section to explain that, right? And to give us that context, because if we're just looking at your transcript and we see a poor grade without an explanation, we're kind of left wondering, well, what happened there? And you know, I really wish the student would have explained this. And so um, that can really, again, add to giving us some more background information 
and be really helpful to us when we're reading your application. Thank you all so much for sharing on that. I think there's quite a few things that could be included um, in this section, so it's great to touch on some specifics. So another question we get commonly, um, or a lot of students have questions about, is test scores. So are they required? So test scores are not required to apply to the QuestBridge program. Um, around 50% of last year's QuestBridge applicants did not have test scores, and we recognize that you as a student may not have been able to take the SAT or ACT at this point in time, um, but we do accept other scores as well as Nayeli alluded to. If you have AP exams or PSAT scores, pre-ACT scores, we can certainly um, take those and you can report them in your application as well. And of course, if you have testing, we do encourage you to enter your test scores and upload your unofficial score reports if possible. Again, adding to that context so we can better get to know you and all of the different aspects of your academic achievement. Thank you, Vanessa. And just a note there too that um, the, what you're able to upload will, will depend on the College Prep Scholars Program versus the National College match. So there may be some differences there in what you can report if you do have test scores, um, but that's a general um, explanation of how our testing works at QuestBridge. So the next question, we get this very, very often. We get students writing in about this, and I know it's kind of a confusing or vague term, but what exactly is an honor? I can take that one. Um, so there's not really an exact answer here because there are lots of different examples that can be included as an honor and we'll accept them. You know, if you feel that it has been, it is something that was a recognition of some sort, that could be from your school, from your community, um, even from like the state or district level, that kind of recognition would definitely be considered an honor. Um, maybe something like you've been nominated for a position or you were like elected in a role at your school or club or community. Those kinds of things would definitely be considered an honor. Um, I think that because there's no exact answer or exact definition that we work off of, you can include anything that you think are along those lines that represented you as someone who is a strength in your community. And, uh, and really being honored for the work or um, uh, knowledge that you have provided to something. I think all of those things can really be considered an honor or an achievement of any kind um, that you have shown in your, in your setting. Thank you, Nayeli. Okay, so we're gonna talk about activities now. Um, so this section is divided into a couple different parts or a couple different sections. But from a reader's perspective, what do you like to see uh, in these activity sections? I can take that one. And I think with this section, one of the things that we like to see as readers is for you to show us how you're spending your time outside of the classroom. And this can include household responsibilities. This can include paid work or other activities outside of school. Um, this could be college preparation organizations you're involved with. And all of these are separated into different sections. And we really want to see how you're spending your time, but we understand it may look different for everyone. So you don't need to fill out every section if it's not applicable to you. We just want to gain an understanding across all sections given. And especially for our population, we understand that many of you might not have access to the same extracurriculars as some of your peers in school with clubs. And you might often have to work a job or have to take care of your family or younger siblings. So please include that in your application. That is just as valid as if you're in a club or an activity at school. So when you're writing about the different activities and your involvements, please make sure that you're explaining what that involvement is and what you're doing in that space. So that way we understand how you're spending your time. And adding to that last point that Clay just made, it's really important for us to see the depth of your involvement, whether that is in a school activity or club or um, a local or regional organization that you're a part of or even um, in your job and in what you do at home, right? So there are spaces throughout the application in that section for you to kind of dive a little bit deeper and give us some more context. Again, going back to that with um, kind of what you're involved in, if you have leadership positions or how you 
grown in an organization or how um, your contributions to your family by taking care of a younger sibling has really you know, helped your parents out if they have to like work full time or something like that. Um, the other thing I will add quickly is don't be afraid to, again, kind of explain all the different things that you're involved in. We obviously have all read applications for quite some time now, and we're very familiar with most clubs and organizations that schools have, but there are times where we come across something that we're unfamiliar with, and um, maybe it's more of a local or regional club or organization, and there are acronyms there that you're using that we just don't know. Um, so if the space allows for it, please do try and explain the acronym so that we're not left kind of guessing um, and left to our own devices, trying to figure out what it is that you participate in. I also just want to add for the paid work and the family or home responsibility section to really be thorough there, um, there are going to be questions about when you do, did some of these things, the many hour, how many hours you've done them throughout the week, that kind of stuff. Really be um, clear and complete that whole section because like the, the others have mentioned, like we want to know more about what you're doing outside of the classroom. So that those whole sections are very important to be fully complete. Um, and also, I would just mention that uh, there's a there's going to be a prompt too if that says which one of these are more meaningful. And because there is a limit of five of these the extracurricular activities, be sure that the ones that you're mentioning are meaningful to you, right? And they are taking time out of your out of your time from studying and things like that. So be be um, really thorough and thoughtful about that answer and mention why you are, why you see, they see that as more meaningful. And that doesn't have to be the extracurricular activities that you're involved in. The, like what Vanessa mentioned, like if you're taking care of a, a sibling outside of um, when your parents are gone or things like that, like if that's meaningful to you, be, be sure to tell us that. Um, we wanna be able to know that and see who you are outside of the classroom. So that's what those examples are for, um, and the, excuse me, what those sections are for. Um, so we just want to make sure that you understand that and you're being thoughtful about it. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's a lot of components to this section of the application. Um, so there's a lot of advice there. And last piece of advice is just make sure you're reading the instructions carefully for each section and, and know too, um, you know, if, if a section is not applicable to you, that's okay. It's just um, getting a picture, a, a big picture like Clay had mentioned of how you spend your time, what you're spending your time on. Um, so we get to know you better as a student and as a person. So we're going to switch to the writing section. I know we get a, a lot of questions on this, um, and we do actually have an in-depth essay brainstorming session. You can watch the, <clears throat> excuse me, write a college essay that stands out webinar. So that's available on our YouTube channel. Um, that'll go in-depth into the writing process, how you can brainstorm for our essay prompt specifically, but um, I do want to share or ask our panelists today to share their different tips for the writing section. So the first question is, how should students approach the short answer section? So these short answers, I would say, are pretty unique to the QuestBridge application. So you might not see something like this in other applications of other scholarships or, or colleges. Um, so this is really a chance for you to tell us again who you are um, outside of the other sections that we're getting to know you in. Um, so just really be, be authentic, be genuine about your answers. Um, these are some of the fun ones I think that I would say readers really like to read because it's a little bit more um, genuine and just outside of the normal academic questions that you would receive. So really just be yourself here and um, Make sure that you are answering them again thoughtfully. I definitely want to echo what Nayeli was saying that we love reading the short answers and one piece of advice that I have for all of you and something to avoid is often we see really strong personal essays, but then when it comes to the short answers, it is clear that the student didn't take their time, that they didn't proofread them, and that they didn't take the short answers as seriously. However, we want you to take your time to really be thoughtful with your responses 
and please use proper grammar and punctuation, just as you would in your essay, because we're still assessing your writing ability. And since you have limited space, you do not need to restate the prompt when you're answering these questions. Just dive in right into your answer. We want to see how you're going to approach these fun questions, and we want to get your response. So there's no need in the first two lines to just re readdress the prompt. Dive right in and let us know what you're thinking. One piece of advice I'd love to share is to um, avoid being repetitive across the different short answer and even your personal essay responses, right? As Nayeli and Clay have mentioned, this is a great spot for us to get to know you, your interests, what you're passionate about, and what motivates you. And we want you to take advantage of that space and present to us the different sides of who you are and um, and show us all of your different interests and your background and just use that space wisely. I think sometimes we see students echoing similar themes across the different short answers and personal essays. Um, and you know, we always love reading and learning more about you, but we want to be able to see the different sides of you and we want you to see and take advantage of that space, um, again, because this is the only way that we have to get to know you is by reading your application. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa Clay and Ailey. Those are great pieces of advice. And so I think a lot of it is applicable to the next question, um, but I do wanna dive a little bit deeper into the significance of the personal essay. So what, what is it, what's the significance and uh, what makes a good essay? I would say that the significance is that it offers us readers um, really a window, so to say, into who you are, into your personal life, into like what the what are some experiences that you've had that shaped who you are today. So that is really the significance there. Um, and it really, just like we mentioned before, it provides information that we don't get other in another spot of the application, because this is where you get to really tell us details. Uh, personal to you, personal to your experience. So again, it's a window. We, we can see who you are in this application and make sure you're taking that seriously. Um, this is probably your first chance to really write a college application essay. So take it seriously and be sure to note that because we take it seriously when we read it as seeing it as a window to who you are, um, you're showing every part that you want to uh, about yourself in this essay um, and sharing things that are significant to you. I would also add to that as you're thinking about your personal essay, think about the way you want to be engaging the reader, right? So while it is your personal story, um, we would love for you to kind of think about how to begin your personal um, essay in a way that is compelling and captivating. And we read so many applications and um, we see a lot that start off with, you know, my name is such and such, or I was born on this day or in this location. And I think there are probably other ways where you can showcase some of that. You know, we already know what your name is because we've been reading your application. We know information about, you know, where you were born because that was also information that you shared earlier on um, in the application as well. So just kind of think about ways that you can, again, going back to kind of taking advantage of that space and, you know, needing to share information that is newer to us or that can you know help you tell your story in a more um, engaging manner. And finally, one thing that I want to add is one of the things that we see often with the personal essays is that students can choose to write about difficult or challenging circumstances. And if you are going to do that, one of the things that we've seen in some of the stronger responses is when you try to show growth or resilience or what you've learned from those experiences, it's, you do not have to write about something that is difficult in your story, but we know that sometimes those things come up. And I think what we've seen is some of the stronger responses talk about what did they learn from that experience? How did they grow? What, how have they been able to navigate those difficult circumstances? So if you do choose to write about that, we try to recommend framing it in that way. Great, thank you all so much. Um, so yeah, I, you kind of touched on this in, in, your, in the last question, but 
how can students make sure that they're telling their story in a unique way? I think one of the things we sometimes see with the um, personal essays in particular um, relates to kind of the focus of the, the essay. And we understand, as Clay was mentioning, there may have been circumstances around you that have really shaped who you are and influenced your perspective and, you know, the, the challenges that you have faced and all that you have overcome. But remember that we're trying to get to know you better. So make sure that you tie it back to focus on yourself, not someone else or other other people in your family who may have helped shape you. I think it's important for you to give us that context and explain that, but make sure that ultimately we're learning about um, how your situation or the people that are in your life have really impacted your worldview and your perspective and how you're planning to you know, take that to the next level when you're in college. Uh, make sure that you are being descriptive in what you are illustrating in your responses and you implement um, just descriptive phrases. Make sure you're telling us your story and, um, you know, showing us all of the different experiences that you have gone through and not just kind of recounting in first grade. This is, you know, what happened in third grade. This is what happened. Um, and just think up, think about it like you, if you were telling a friend a story, you know, how would you go about that? And what are the main takeaways that you would want that person to know about, um, about your story? I just want to echo what Vanessa said, like, definitely don't feel like you need to say everything, right? Every single moment that you um, have experienced. One, there is a uh, word limit, so be sure to make sure you're paying attention to that, but also the fact that um, you can just focus on one you know, common theme or just a few key points in your essay. And I think that that would be, um, that, that's a more um, clear way to tell us your story. So just focus, keep your focus um, noticeable and so that we know what you're talking about and you don't have to go you know, super late, like back in time in your life. It doesn't have to be everything, just kind of keep it succinct. That's such great advice, thank you so much. I remember recalling back to when I wrote this essay, um, and I'm sure you all have similar experiences writing essays. I definitely ran into some of those pitfalls, especially with the personal essay and telling your story. Um, so it's really great advice to share. And the last thing I just wanna ask you all, um, so I know those are more specific to the personal essay and some of our short answer questions, but what are just your general writing tips um, that you like to see when you're reading or that you think would help in an application as they're writing? I can take this one. And I think some of the things that definitely can help our applicants as they approach this section is to make sure to proofread both your short answers and your essay. And something that you can do in this proofreading process is write your first draft and then take a step away and come back to it later with fresh eyes. That definitely can help you to catch some of those grammatical errors. And maybe you'll realize that isn't what I'm trying to convey. And you can rewrite those sentences. Um, we also recommend reading your essay aloud because that can also help you to catch some things that might not sound the way you want it to, and it can help you correct those errors as well. We also recommend um, asking a counselor or a teacher or one of your peers um, to read your responses and give you feedback. We do recognize, though, that that can be difficult because of the sensitive personal info that you can include in your short answers or your essay. But if you have a teacher or a friend or um, a mentor who you trust, having them look over your responses can be really beneficial because it can give you that outside perspective and you can improve your writing. But we do still want to see your authentic voice. So don't over edit and have too many people look at it because we wanna hear your personal voice come through in your writing. And it's okay if there is some things that are unique to how you write. And then finally, some of the things that you can do when you're actually formatting your writing that can be really helpful for us as readers, and every time we see it, we get very excited, is please make sure to use paragraphs. If there's one wall of text, it's really hard to see differences in ideas. So break up your essay into different paragraphs and have topic sentences, because that can really help to allow your essay to flow. 
And then please avoid unusual formatting because if you're using different types of formatting or different line breaks, that might not work with the application platform or it may be hard for the reader to understand. So we recommend using the application proof for your writing to see what it looks like after you've pasted it in. Um, that way you know that what you're submitting is what you intended it to be. So those are some tips that I have when it comes to writing. Ah, thank you, Clay. That's awesome. I mean, that, that applies to anything, but um, specifically for, <laughs> for our application and our writing section, I think that's really great advice. Uh, so thank you for chiming in there. Okay, so those were some general writing tips. Um, but now I just want to close out by asking you all about any final tips you may have, uh, particularly as they pertain to students getting ready to submit their applications. To build off of what I was just talking about is to make sure you proofread your entire application, not just the writing section. Look at every section of the application and look at things such as capitalization and your grammar and make sure that you're consistently writing the same way throughout the application, because sometimes we'll definitely notice in the financial or household section that there can be some grammatical errors. And if you just proofread that section, you can fix those before you submit. And please review the application proof, which you can do after you filled out the entire application application, and it allows you to see what we'll see when we download your application to read it. And then finally, make sure to remind your teacher about your recommendation, give them enough time to work on it and remind them of the deadline. And then after they have submitted it, thank them. They're doing something for you. They're writing about, they're taking their time to write this recommendation. So make sure to say thank you or send them a thank you email or write them a thank you note. And that is really meaningful. And we hear from a lot of recommenders that when they get that from a student, it makes them want to help other students in this process? Um, I would say for my final tip is to definitely make sure that you are presenting who you are and the way that you want to present yourself to us throughout the entire application. I know I mentioned this before in the writing section, but it applies to the whole application because this is our chance to get to know you. So if you are showing us who you are and in the way that you want to, um, in the most positive way, in the most personal way, that would really make the difference um, in the whole application, but specifically in the writing sections. Um, I would definitely say that we are learning who you are throughout this. So it's so it's super important for us to know um, the all of the pieces that you want us to know in, in the application. So that's super important. And I would also say, I know we've mentioned this um, earlier, but to definitely use the additional information sections to your advantage um, because everyone has very specific and unique circumstances in their lives. And we don't know that unless you tell us. So these are really important sections for us to know a little bit more, a little more background, things that you couldn't explain in some of the other sections, um, especially in like the financial, um, the income sections, those are really important for us to know um, about just some additional additional information that you need to tell us. So make sure that you are using those to your advantage um, and definitely pay attention to the prompts that are asked throughout the application. Um, so we don't have to guess, right? And, and, or really assume anything about your situation. We wanna be able to know for sure. So that would be my final tip. My final piece of advice, and I know this is difficult, is try to not wait until the very last minute to submit your application. Uh, we know that many students, most students, wait until the last possible second to submit. We know you want to proofread, put your final touches, make sure you're reviewing your application proof, and as everyone said, kind of presenting yourself in the way that you want to be presented. Um, but make sure you're building enough time to do all of that in case any last minute issues arise. It could be like a technical glitch. It could be something with the internet on your end and you just don't want to put all of that um, at risk because we know that you have spent so much time on your application. Your recommenders have put in time to submit your letter and um, we just want to make sure that you feel really confident about the application that you are putting forward to us and to you know the colleges at a later point down the line um, to read. So 
make sure that as you're thinking about the presentation of your application, that you're not procrastinating and waiting until the last minute in case there's things outside of your control that might prevent you from submitting that application that you worked so diligently on. Yes, Ugh, those are all great pieces of advice. For that last one, as someone who um, is answering emails very late on the day of the application, I can attest to that. We get a lot of last minute technical errors or something's not appearing the way you want it or a field, a prompt, a new prompt appeared because of the way you answered a question. So definitely reiterate um, building in some time to proofread and, and just feel uh, good about your application as you submit it. Um, so that concludes our webinar for today. Those were the sections we wanted to cover. So I just wanna say thank you um, to all of our panelists, to Clay, Nayeli, Vanessa for joining today. It's so helpful to get your perspective on these different parts of the application. Um, so I'll bid you three adieu. I'm gonna finish out the webinar with uh, some general resources that you can use as you or students can use as they're uh, going through the application, especially on some of these different sections we talked about. Um, so just thank you all one more time for, for joining. Okay, so before we discuss resources available to you, um, I just wanna quickly cover the timeline of the College Prep Scholars Program. So here's an overview, starting with the application opening in February and closing in late March. Then in April, College Prep Scholars will be selected and awarded summer opportunities. In the late summer, your application will carry over to the National College Match, and you will be able to submit your National College Match application in the fall as a senior in high school. So in regards to some resources available to you, so on-demand webinars, including this one, you can find on our YouTube channel by visiting www.youtube.com slash QuestBridge. And in this playlist, you'll find webinars, a webinar with tips for selecting recommenders and requesting recommendations, the do's and don'ts of essay writing that we mentioned in today's webinar that you can check out for more tips and resources on that particular section of the application. And then also today's webinar going behind the scenes of application reading uh, with our QuestBridge staff. Another great resource that's available on our YouTube channel is our Quest Tips videos. Um, these provide step-by-step -step instructions, highlights of really important reminders in the application, as well as common technical issues for various parts of the application. If you haven't started an application yet, apply now to the College Prep Scholars Program for high school juniors. The application deadline is Wednesday, March 22nd at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. If you have any questions, visit our Help Center at questbridge.org slash askqb, or for more specific questions, email us at questions at questbridge.org. For upcoming opportunities, please visit the webinars page on our website at questbridge.org slash webinars. Thank you again for joining and best of luck on your application.